some of y'all know I did some, I did a lot of, I spent a lot of time in school, and I pretty much lived in school for a good number of years, and uh, my college debt shows that. It's a little bit unfortunate. Uh, I spent some time at UNC Charlotte in a religious studies program. Now, from undergraduate, I'd gone to Garden with Baptist school, good Baptist school, good Baptist background. Um, but when I went to UNC Charlotte, it was a different beast altogether. I was in there with a lot of people who were studying religion that weren't Christians. They weren't even religious. They were studying religion from an outside perspective, almost sometimes a sociological perspective in some different ways, but uh, uh, it was different. I had to take a methods class, my first class. In fact, uh, I was talking to my son Jonas the other day when we went down to Caraway, we drove past UNC Charlotte, and my wife, Chandra, excuse me, Chandra was pregnant with uh, Jonas, my first semester at UNC Charlotte. And in fact, uh, I was in that class, that methods class, whenever uh, Jonas was, that September when Jonas was born. But that methods class, one of the things we tried to do almost the whole semester in some ways was to define what is religion. You know, growing up in Baptist church, and you know, going to Baptist church my whole life, and going off to college at a Baptist school, I thought I knew what religion was until I took this class and I come to find out my perspective of religion is different than other people's perspectives of religion. And I found out that uh, even in my own denomination, after a while, that religion is defined in different ways. But the question is, what is religion? We've got songs about that old-time religion. You ever sang a song about that old-time religion? You mean that old-time religion? What is that old-time religion? Well, for most Christians, that old-time religion is Christianity. But what is religion? And, uh, I think I was looking at the slides here, but, uh, what is religion? I've got this slide done up. It looks like my technology is not working. And I should have practiced this three or four times. I should have been. Uh, what is religion? Well, I've got several different definitions here I want to mention to you. The first one, I'll read it to you. The belief in and worship of a superhuman controlling power, especially a personal God or gods. That's from the Oxford Dictionary. Another religion, this is from Wikipedia, which uh, if y'all on the internet, if you ever heard anybody talk about Wikipedia, sadly a lot of students, college students these days, they go to Wikipedia first before they go to actual sources. Wikipedia is, is a peer-reviewed, not a peer-reviewed, excuse me, site. Anybody can contribute to Wikipedia. Uh, it's like the Encyclopedia Britannica, but what if, imagine if anybody, any Joe, can contribute to Encyclopedia Britannica. It wouldn't necessarily be totally right, would it? Wikipedia defines religion as a uh, religion is a set of beliefs that is held by a group of people so passionately with some, uh, with some sort of sacrifice. Uh, the Holman Illustrated Bible Dictionary says religion is a relationship of devotion or a fear of God or gods. And in uh, the last definition I have here for you is from the uh, Interpreter's Dictionary Bible. Respect and awe of the sacred and divine, strict observance of rich, religious ritual or consciousness in a, in a morality and ethics. So some key words I'd highlight on the slide if my technology would have been working, I would have shown you this. But there's things like belief, relationship, morality and ethics. Um, it's, these things kind of stick out when you talk about religion. Stick out. What is religion? For Christianity, it's relationship. It's morality and ethics. It is belief. But also look at a definition in a narrow sense and look at the book of James today. We're going to be looking at James chapter 1, verses 19 through 27. You're welcome to turn there if you want to turn your Bibles. If not, I'll, I'll read with you. But the first two verses, 19 and 20, was talking about going fast and going slow. You ever been on the interstate or four lane road? Let's say you're getting on 321 from here going down toward 85 or Gastonia. And you get back to the big old line of traffic. Sometimes you go fast, you go slow, you scoot poop around. Let's talk about going fast and going slow as far as religion goes. Verses 19 20 of James chapter 1. I'm reading from the NIV. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. So James encourages us to be quick to listen, slow
slow to speak. I have a disease, guys. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a disease. It's called chronic foot and mouth disease. If you have chronic foot and mouth disease, raise your hand. And those that didn't raise your hand, I know you're probably lying to me. <laughs> right? What is chronic foot and mouth disease? Well, oftentimes I speak before I think and I put my foot in my mouth. <laughs> if you don't know me already and you get to know me, you'll come to find out. I tend to be a little quick to speak. But James encourages us not to be quick to speak. Slow to speak. Slow to speak. Oftentimes our words can cut through people's can't. Oftentimes our words can harm people more than our actions can. Slow to speak. Quick to listen. Everyone should be quick to listen. You know, one of the things I've learned about being around people, especially those that are grieving, and I think we Christians should take note of this, especially uh, here recently in life for our church, is we should listen more and talk less. Listen more and talk less. One of the things I've learned through ministry and through classes, what have you, is, is uh, a lot of times, especially when somebody's hurting, we don't need to say anything. We just need to be there. Be a shoulder to cry on, be somebody to, to say hello. And there's a prime example in the Bible. And I'll, I'll mention this example. One of my favorite books of the Bible, as far as uh, just challenges me and, and gets me thinking, is uh, Job. Job, uh, Job had a bit of a story. If you're all familiar with the story, Job uh, uh, is caught up in this little th way between uh, the devil or Satan and God. And, and uh, he eventually comes to this point where everything's taken from him, and his children are dead, and his property is destroyed, his wife even says, curse God and die. And she leaves him. He's sick. And he's got some buddies, Bill Dad, Zophar, and Eliphaz, and over in chapter 2. They come and they sit down with him. For seven nights and seven days, they don't say a word, they just sit with him. Maybe they attend to him, I don't know, the text doesn't tell us. For seven nights and seven days, they were good friends. And chapter 3 is Job says a few words, a little monologue. Over chapter 4 is where we find the relationship between Bildad so, so far and Eliphaz and Job going downhill. Because guess what? Chapter 4, they open their mouths. These buddies start opening their mouths. And if you're familiar with the story, Job, once they open their mouths, they start saying, Well, Job, you know what? The reason everything's going wrong with you is, is that you've sinned somewhere you need to repent. All this stuff. And then, see, in their mindset, you know, God is you know, punishing Job. Well, I wonder what's going on anyway. You ever heard the expression, they didn't know they're both on the ground? They didn't know they're both on the ground. They didn't have the full picture of God's head. You see, if they had just kept their mouth shut, so they were doing what was right, being there for Job. But the problem came. Over their mouths. In Christianity, one of the things that we need to do is to do. And don't do. We need to be that person that listens, is quick to listen. Somebody that's willing to listen to somebody. And if nothing else is to hear somebody rant and rave about what's going on, we need to do that sometimes. Not offer judgment, not criticize, just listen. And if we are slow to speak and we formulate what we're going to say, things might be pretty, come out a little bit better. But if we're quick to speak, guess what? The next little phrase in, in James chapter 1, uh, verse 19 comes in and says, uh, be slow to become angry. Oftentimes our words, when we're quick to speak, we cause problems, don't we? We incite anger sometimes. We're quick to judge, quick to criticize. You see, oftentimes when I'm quick to speak, oftentimes when I'm uh, right there ready to say something in response, or ready to say something I shouldn't, it's because of me and my individuality and my petty passions. And as we have relationships with other people, as we talk to other people, what we need to realize is it ain't always about us and what we want, what we think. 
but you know, our petty passions get in the way. And sometimes we get angry over the pettiest stuff because it's what we want. You see, as James reminds us that human anger, human pettiness, human self-centeredness, it doesn't produce the righteousness of God. And what is the righteousness of God? It's a standard. It's a standard that God has for us. And God's standard is, is for loving others, loving ourselves, and caring for other people. When we're too busy focusing on ourselves and our passions, our pettiness, and we become angry, we say what we want to say and instead of listening to somebody else, it's turning the picture on us. And God don't want the spotlight just on us. God wants the spotlight on Him and others as well. You see, God wants us in communal harmony. And communal harmony, being uh, with other people and working together and living together, especially our fellow Christians, involves listening, really bad at listening. Empathizing. Put yourself in other people's shoes. Understanding. And mirroring our words judiciously. Oftentimes we as Christians in a matter of situation, if we just take a minute, sit back and think, and try to understand, we won't be as judgmental as we often are. Something I share with former congregation, I think it's fitting, and I always try to remember this because I'm bad at doing this, remember this myself. Whenever you point a finger, guess what? You got fingers pointing back at you, right? If we're quick to point a finger, or quick to say something, we forget about ourselves. There's a few verses of scripture I want to throw out to you to think about our words and how our words may affect us. Proverbs 13:3: people who watch their mouths guard their lives. Those who open their lips are ruined. Proverbs 15:1. A sensitive answer turns back wrath. Wrath, excuse me. But an offensive word stirs up anger. Fast and slow. Our religion, our Christianity needs to be fast and slow. Fast to listen, to empathize, to understand, and slow in terms of putting a spotlight on us and what we feel, what we think. That's what we need. But our Christianity, our true religion, also needs to put aside and receive. Put aside and receive. James chapter 1, verse 21, Therefore get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word implanted in you which can save you. We need to put aside and receive. Put aside or get rid of uh, the evil that's in our lives and in our world. Now, the language, the imagery here of putting aside is almost like taking off a dirty shirt or dirty clothes and putting it aside. I hate mowing grass in the summertime. I hate mowing grass in general, but I hate mowing grass in the summertime. Um, I sweat profusely. And my clothes, when I'm out working in the yard, especially this past, this past Tuesday because I've worked with some bushes, I had a layer of filth probably this high on me. It felt like at least. But man, the best thing in the world was taking off that dirty shirt and those dirty pants and those dirty shoes. Put them aside and wash them. You see, God can forgive us of our sins, but we have to actively, habitually, Choose to do what's right and put aside the evil. Eventually choose not to choose evil. See, Christian obedience is never uh, Christian obedience, excuse me, requires us daily putting on Christ and not putting on evil. And if we get that dirty evilness in our lives, put it aside. And whenever we get up every morning, God allows us to get up. Whether we want to or not, especially in my house, the sound of an alarm clock, deafening, piercing my eardrums. Each day I choose Christ. Put aside the filth of this world. What are some of the things of filth and evil in this world? Well, it's anger, it's malice. Put those things aside and choose Christ, the way of Christ. Accepting the word that's been planted in us. What is this word? What's the good news of Jesus Christ that already has roots in us? We have to let God grow in us each day. 
one of the things about salvation we Baptists often forget about is, you know, we get, especially as Southern Baptists, we get this notion of we're saved and we're good. God wants us to get saved. But it doesn't just stop there at that moment of salvation. We accept Christ in our hearts. We have to grow, don't we? We can't be like when Paul talks about the imagery of milk and, and stuff. You know, we can't just be stuck on the milk all the time like babies. We have to get move up to those steaks and potatoes, right? We have to grow. We have to let God's um, salvation grow in us. We have to let God's um, discipleship grow in us. There's imagery in Paul of, you know, you're saved, you're being saved, you will be saved. This notion of at one point you accepted Jesus into your life, accepted, you asked for forgiveness of your sin, but you're being saved and then this notion of working out your salvation fear and trembling, that God grows us and helps us grow closer to Him each day. It's a process. My Methodist friends talk about sanctification. Most Baptists don't use that language per se, but not in that context of discipleship. But we need to grow each day. And eventually this notion of will be saved is one day all this process of us growing, letting this, these roots grow in us, culminates in glory when we're not to worry about this world anymore. And we are saved. We will be saved. You see, we have to let this uh, word that has root in us grow and put off all this evil. Choose life. Choose God. Um, but not only does you know, Christianity, our religion, involve fast and slow, putting aside, receiving, but also involves listening and doing. Verses 22 through 25. Do not merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the Word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after that, after looking at himself, goes away immediately forgets what he looks like. Whoever looks into the perfect law gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. We need to be doing, not just listening. Not just using our words, but doing. There's a lot of Christians in this world that, that talk a good game. We've, we've talked about this at Just Do It sermon I had a little while back. A lot of Christians talk a good game. They say all the right words. Well, I'm a Christian. I go to church. And they might even time. They might be active in the church. But outside the church walls, how they live. We're told to just do it. We're called to be doers of the Word. Not just listen, listen to the Word. And the Word is the saving grace of Jesus Christ. We need to live it out. We need to live out our salvation in this community. We need to live it out. Because, well, we deceive ourselves, don't we? If we just listen. We deceive ourselves. You see, no matter how extensive one's scriptural knowledge is, how amazing one's memory is, if we just know the Word, we don't live it out, it's deceiving ourselves. That's all it is. You ever heard the expression uh, muscle memory? One of the things I've heard playing sports in high school and I hear today listening to sports talk and stuff is the muscle memory. You've heard it sometimes with physical therapists talk about muscle memory. The muscles get used to doing something, you know, for baseball, you know, just hitting that ball or throwing that ball, you used to throw it a certain way, or football or basketball or whatever, you know. Your muscles get used to doing a certain thing and you have to, if you get out of that routine, you have to retrain your muscles in some way to that. We Christians need muscle memory, if you will, when it comes to living out the gospel. We can't just hear it. We've got to put it in practice. And once we put it in practice, we experience it in a new and different way that changes us. Not forgetting, but doing. You see, James talks about people forgetting what they look like, what they've heard. We need to do it. Look at this perfect law of freedom. This muscle memory we have to do. Verses 26 and 27 kind of give a summation of the passage. Those who consider themselves religious and do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. One of my favorite verses in all the Bible is James 1.27. 
Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. You see, we live a religion and we have a Christianity that is about words, it's about beliefs, it's about uh, what we say. But I'm of a firm belief that our Christianity should do something. Our Christianity should live a certain way. It's about morality and ethics, not just the words. See, James emphasizes a religion that does. It cares for those in need, the widows and orphans, those that have no else to care for. It's, it, it's a type of religion that keeps oneself from the, uh, the world and the, the wicked ways of this world. It's a, it's a type of religion that does things by keeping bridle of the tongue. And watching what we say. It's a religion of action. A religion of words. What would people say about your Christianity based off your actions? If somebody were to sit down and write down all things they've seen you do, about your day at work, home, wherever. Based off your actions. Not what you say, mind you, but off your actions. Would it categorize you as Christian? Would it? We can say all we want to say about our affiliation with Jesus. Until we live it, it don't mean much. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only the one who does the will of my Father is in heaven. Read it one more time. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father is in heaven. We could sit down and try to define what Christianity is, and I'm sure different denominations, you know, are. are Different denominations of Presbyterian brothers, or Lutheran brothers and sisters, or Methodist brothers and sisters, or Catholic brothers and sisters, Orthodox brothers and sisters, and all these different stripes of Christianity. They may refine or define, excuse me, religion or Christianity differently. But I think every denomination in some way talks about doing, living out the Christian faith. In some way or another, we as Baptists especially need to live it. Not just in these walls, not behind, not just behind the stained glass 